Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar presented by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. My name is Ken Nowak with the Bureau of Reclamation and I'm one of the team leads on critical management question number one, water management and climate change. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Laura Condon with the Bureau of Reclamation to talk about resources for climate model data and climate model informed hydrology projections. Laura has eight years of experience in the water resources field from both private and federal sectors. She has experience in climate impacts, planning, and extremes. In addition to her work with the Bureau of Reclamation, she's also pursuing a PhD at the Colorado School of Mines. In a moment, I'll turn the presentation over to Laura. Everyone will be muted and we'll take questions at the end. If you do have something that you need to get uh, in touch with us on quickly or immediately, please feel free to use the raise hand feature and we'll get in touch with you or unmute the lines for a question. Thanks very much and welcome, Laura. Thank you for the introduction, Ken. So I'll just jump right in. As Ken mentioned, I'm going to be talking about resources for climate model data and hydrology projections. and uh, let me just see how I get this. Okay, there we go. So most of what I'm going to be talking about is the resources that we have available through a website that's uh, been worked on a lot by Reclamation, but also several other federal and non-federal agencies where we have bias-corrected and downscaled climate and hydrology projections available for everyone to download. So I want to give you some background on what goes into that and then show you how to access this data and how you can use it for whatever kind of analysis you're doing. So before I get to the website, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, I know that uh, just from Ken's introduction, I know, there, I know there's kind of a diverse crowd here, so hopefully it won't be too much background, but I'm going to give a little background on global climate models and the methods, specifically the statistical methods that we're using to downscale and bias correct the data that we're hosting, and then how we generate hydrologic projections using the VIC model. And then I'll go to the website and walk you through just how, we can, how you can get data for yourself and just a quick example at the end for how you can apply this data. So I would also like to point out before I start that there are also um, additional training resources online in addition to what I'll be covering today. So there's a video explaining the website. There are actually two videos explaining the website and what's where. And those are pretty quick, like four to ten minute videos. But also if you want more detail on how to select projections, how to prepare your data, and different statistical methods, there's a Comet MetEd training course. So there's also a link to on the website, and I'll show you this link when we get to the website later. And this, um, this is more of like a four to five hour training. So I just want to point you to those if you want to uh, learn some more after this. All right, so this is the big picture of what we're generally trying to accomplish with this type of analysis. So there are generally agreed upon with the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, uh, emission scenarios for what the future could look like as far as greenhouse gas concentrations. And the challenge for water managers is to figure out what do those emission scenarios mean for water management operations. So in order to do that, we have to take greenhouse gas concentrations and use them to simulate the global climate. That's where global climate models come in. But that information is usually at too coarse of a resolution to use directly for decision making and planning. So there's this, an additional spatial downscaling and often a bias correction step involved. And then usually we take that, that information, which are, those are going to be variables, climate variables like precipitation and temperature, but we also need other variables like runoff and snow, so we feed those into a hydrologic model. And these are both the spatial downscale climate data and the hydrologic data are what's available on our website. In addition, often you might want to use this data and put it into an operations model or some sort of ecological model, different, different models to answer your specific question. So that's really the last step. So in general, the goal is to figure out what greenhouse gas emissions are going to mean in the future for your specific location. And try to get the slide to change. Oh, there we go. Uh, so, for, so we start off with global climate models. And so these are really just numerical models that are simulating the physics of the atmosphere, the ocean, and the land surface across the entire globe. 
And so these have a lot of components to them. I have just this really simple diagram here. Uh, so it's including the atmosphere, the ocean, sea ice, land surface. There are a lot of different uh, different global climate models are developed by research groups all around the world, and as we are, they're continuing to evolve. So there's additional focus on things like biogeochemical cycling in the latest models and all sorts of processes. This is really a simplified, uh, simplified diagram. But the point here is that it's a discrete representation of the world, and a generally low resolution from the purpose of doing local analysis, so roughly one degree gridded resolution across the world, uh, but pretty good temporal resolution, so about three hours. And again, the point is that we have data for, for the entire world. And I mentioned that there are models developed by many groups around the world. And what we use them for in general is to, first of all, do climate attribution, so try to explain the physical processes that are responsible for the behavior we're observing. But then also, which is what um, I'm guessing more of you are interested in, is using them to predict response of climate system to change. So if we have increased greenhouse gas concentrations, what is that going to mean for things like precipitation and, and temperature 100 years in the future? And what's really great is that the climate community is pretty well organized, and there's a coupled model intercomparison project. So even though global climate models are developed by a range of research groups around the world, they've actually established a standard experimental protocol so that all of the global climate models in this CMIP database are actually adhering to the same rules and solving the same problems generally. So what this means is there's a standard set of model simulations, so they all have the same agreed upon historical period that they're simulating. So generally in this, I'll talk about 1950 to 1999. And they all simulate the same future emission scenarios. And then, of course, there's also a standard set of data protocols, so it's really easy to access all of the data from all of these different models in a consistent way. And there are currently two. Uh, I don't know, iterations of this available. So there's CMIP 3 and CMIP 5. And so CMIP 3 is the older one. And uh, for this, they simulated three emission scenarios. I'm just showing this graph here that shows you can see from 1900 uh, to 2000 is the historical period. And then after that, they start forcing the climate models with different emission scenarios. So they have kind of, in the CMIP 3 one, there's a low, medium, and high scenario. and these have been simulated with 16 different climate models for the three emission scenarios. And then for each climate model, there can also be different initial conditions. So in total, the CMIP-3 archive has 112 projections. And now the CMIP-5 is the most recent archive. And this is slightly different. There have been improvements and changes in models. But also, there are now four different emission scenarios. So that's what I'm showing here. They call them relative concentration pathways for CMIP-5. So this is RCP 8, 6, 4.5, and 2.6. And the CMIP-5 archive is also bigger than the CMIP-3 archive. So here, there are 37 models, uh, four emission scenarios, as I mentioned. And then again, there's different initial conditions for the models. So you get a total of 231 projections. So we have both of these archives available on our website. And I'd like to point out that although the CMIP-5 archive is the most recent archive, there have been several comparisons, and there are definitely differences between CMIP-5 and CMIP-3. But um, there's not a definitive answer that, OK, CMIP-5 is significantly better than CMIP-3, and you should throw out all your CMIP-3 analysis or anything like that. So um, they're definitely both still applicable, and you can still use both of them. So, OK, so now you have the global climate models. But in order to use them for local decision making and planning, you need to downscale the output. So as I mentioned, these global climate models are run at about one degree resolution, which is really just too broad for any sort of regional planning. So what we want to do is take this data and come up with monthly precipitation and temperature data at the 1 h degree scale. So that's roughly 12 kilometer. And so this is then a cooperative effort between Reclamation and other partners. Uh, and this is what is really available on, on the website. You can, of course, go download the raw GCM data from the IPCC website. Uh, but through our website, we're hosting the bias-corrected and downscale data. 
So I'm going to be talking about BCSD, which is one method for statistical downscaling. We actually have another that I'll mention briefly when I go through the website, but this is the main one that we're using. So I just want to walk you through what we're doing so you kind of have an understanding for how we're getting from the global climate model to the regional data that you would download. So the first step in BCSD is bias correction. So when you're running a global model, you can end up with systematic over or underestimations of things like precipitation. So before we downscale the data and use it, we want to get rid of any of those systematic biases. So to do that, we pick a historical evaluation period. So generally, we use 1950 to 1999. And it's important to know that we stop at 1999, even though obviously that's 15 years ago now, um, because that's the point at which the global climate models start to diverge. So that's where they start using the different emission scenarios. So that's basically the end of the historical period for the GCM simulations. So we take that, then we take uh, the GCM output and observations, and we get them onto a consistent grid. Uh, so generally, this is still the low resolution grid, so like one to two degree resolution. And for every grid cell in the domain, we assess bias. And we do this on a monthly basis. So if we have 50 years of data, that means um, we'll have 50 values for each month. And we generate CDFs from the GCM and from the observed data. And we generate quantile maps, so figuring out how much you need to adjust each quantile in the GCM data to get it to match that quantile in the observed data. So once we have this roadmap, then we can take time series of precipitation and temperature. So we have our GCM time series, and we grab a point, and we figure out where that falls on our CDF and how much we need to adjust it, and we adjust that value, and then we move forward in our time series. So at the end of this, we have a bias-corrected data set, but it's still at low resolution. So the next step is spatial downscaling. So to do this, we start with a high-resolution observation data set. So this is the resolution that we want our final data set to be at. So in this case, it's 1 8 degree, so roughly 12 kilometers. And we also create from this a an aggregate pattern. So we take this back up to the resolution of the GCM. And this is for the climatological mean. So this is the mean for whatever month, say our January uh, observed mean. So we have that in low resolution. And we compare that. We compare that to the, oops, one too far. Uh, so we compare that, the low resolution observed data to the bias corrected GCM, so they're at the same resolution, and we come up with adjusting, adjustment factors for the difference between the bias corrected GCM and the observed climatology. And then we take those disaggregation factors and we interpolate them to high resolution, so our 1 8th degree resolution. I'm not going to get into the details of that, but we use a SIMAP algorithm to do that. And then finally, we take these factors and apply them to the observed climatology, and we end up with a bias-corrected GCM that is at the resolution that we want. So when you're downloading data from the website, you're downloading GCM data that has been bias-corrected and downscaled using the process that I just outlined. So once we have this, though, this just gives us variables like precipitation and temperature that are coming out of the climate models. But a lot, what's really important for a lot of analysis is understanding the hydrology. So in a, we take the gridded BCSD climate projections, so 112 for the CMIP-3 archive and 231 for the CMIP-5, and we generate gridded hydrology projections. So this gives us variables like runoff, SWE, evapotranspiration, and potential evapotranspiration. And we run we run this through the hydrology model on a daily basis at our 1 8th degree high resolution, so our 12 kilometer spatial resolution. And to do this, we're using the variable infiltration capacity hydrologic model. And I have a schematic of it here. What's important about this is that it's a well established model. It's been developed over the last 10 years, it's been applied to many basins. And it's really designed for doing macro scale modeling. And it can solve water and energy balances, which is really important. So for our CMIP 3 archive, we use VIC version 4.0.7. And then for CMIP 5, which is more recent, we used an updated version of VIC, so 4.1.2. And I'm going to go over VIC uh, pretty quickly here. But you can also, there's a lot of resources online if you want to learn more about VIC. And I've included a link here. 
So in general, there are two steps to VIC modeling. The first one is the land surface simulation, where we're simulating all of the physical processes. And then we have to, because VIC basically treats every grid cell as an isolated column, so then you have to connect everything with routing. So for the first step, we are simulating fluxes of runoff, base flow, evapotranspiration, and other hydrologic variables that are all evolving based on the climate forcing. So using the downscale precipitation and temperature, we feed this into our model and we can get these hydrologic variables. But again, this is just for single columns. So the next step is to connect all of our grid cells together. So we have a river network routing model where we move water from grid cell to grid cell, uh, basically to the outlet of every location of interest. So at the end of this, then we have data sets of climate, of climate variables and hydrologic variables. And that's what we have uh, hosted on the website here. So I'm going to get into the website um, now in a second. Uh, in general, what we have available, as I said, are bias corrected and downscale projections of precipitation and temperature. And these are at the 1 8 degree grid level. And then on this same grid, we have simulated hydrology using the VIC model. So for the climate projections, uh, these are covering the entire contiguous US. For um, the BCSD downscale data, we have 112 CMIP3 and 231 CMIP5 projections, and they all span from 1952, that should say 2099, not 1999. And this has monthly mean precipitation and temperature. I also want to point out that we do have another data set currently on the website, and this is BCCA. So this is um, just a different method of downscaling the data. So this is bias corrected constructed analog method. And basically the difference between the, this and the BCSD, which I walked you through, is that with the analog method, you figure out the spatial patterns using uh, historical days that are, are the most similar to the day you're seeing. Um, but um, I'm not going to talk about that too much because we're actually in the process of replacing that with a different analog method, so with uh, LOCA downscaling. And so this is going to be available in the next couple of months. So I'm not really going to get into the BCCA data too much. But I will say that when the LOCA data is available, this will provide daily precipitation, min temperature, max temperature. And the plan is actually to have this at um, higher resolution, so a 1 16th degree grid rather than the 1 8th degree grid. So that's the climate data. Then for the hydrology data, again, we're on the same 1 8 degree grid. We use the BCSD downscaled climate data to feed into the VIC model. For the CNEP3 projections, this is actually only available for the, West, the western 17 states. But for CMIP 5 it's available for the entire contiguous US. And this has daily, um, daily model input. So here you can get precipitation, temperature, uh, min and max temperature, and wind speed. And then also model outputs including soil moisture, SWE, runoff, potential ET, actual ET, runoff, and base flow. So now I'm just going to escape this and I'm going to take you guys through the website a little bit. Uh, let me just make this bigger. Okay, so um, I have the link in the presentation if you just Google downscaled CMIP 5 and Bureau of Reclamation, you can usually find this website pretty easily. So this is what it looks like. We have a welcome tab here that just shows you, has a summary of any recent activities going on. So as we, uh, for example, replace the BCCA data with local data, that will be updated here. And then on the About tab, you can get a lot of the information that I've just covered as far as what's available. So you see there's a Climate tab and a Hydrology tab. So for the Climate tab, it'll tell you what's going on with CMIP5 and the CMIP3 data. And then it summarizes down here what's available for each data set. And then the same thing for the Hydrology, just summarizing what's been done and then also listing all the attributes that you can download. And you'll be able to see all these attributes also when you try to download data. There'll be a list of attributes, which I'll walk you through. Um, but this is just good if you're wondering like why you can't get a certain kind of data. You can, um, you can see, look back here and see what's where. I'm going to skip tutorials for now. So the projection subset request is really where you are going to want to be. So uh, what you can see here is there are 10 steps. So 
the first thing you have to do is select your time period of analysis. So you can choose to have monthly or daily data. For now, I would stick with monthly because, as I mentioned, the daily data is going to be quickly replaced by the LOCA downscaling. So if you want to get the BCSD data, that's a monthly product. So you see monthly, and then you can pick your time period. Your choices are 1950 through 2099. So I will just go ahead and select. Uh, the entire thing here. And I would like to point out that in the upper right-hand corner, uh, there's a, a size. You can see 100% equals max up here. And this just tells you if the data set you're downloading gets too large, then you're going to have to split it up into multiple downloads. So you can just pay attention to this and see if you're downloading too much in one chunk and if you might need to split it up. Um, okay, so you have the time step then you can select where to get your domain from. You can um, basically just leave this set to all if you're not sure exactly where you're going to go. Um, and there's multiple ways of selecting a subset of the data. So you can define a rectangular area using lat long. You can download it for a specific location. Or what I usually find most useful is to download it for a tributary area. So you can put in a lat long of, say, a stream gauge, and then you can um, click Map Outlet Location, and it'll map the drainage area for that stream gauge, and then you're just going to be downloading the data for that tributary area. Okay, so once we have all that put in, then you have to select what products you're interested in looking at. So here, your choices are for the climate data, BCSD CMIP 3 or CMIP 5, and then the BCCA data, which I mentioned, and then also the BCSD CMIP 3 or CMIP 5 hydrology. So if, for example, we click on BCSD CMIP 5, then you'll see you get a list of all the potential variables you can download. So for example, if you want temperature and precipitation on the 1 8 degree grid, then you can, these are, these are the variables you select, and you can choose how many projections you would like to download. So as I mentioned, there are 231 total to choose from. And there um, this is actually covered a lot more in the Met Ed course. There are a lot of different ways to narrow this down if you want to pick a smaller subset. But often it's good to just go ahead and download all 231 of them so you can look at the range of changes in precipitation and temperature in the future. So then you can select a smaller subset if you need to after you've actually looked at the data. So generally, I just click on all. And what you can see here, uh, so this is CMIP 5 data. So we have the four emissions pathways on in the columns here, and then down the rows are the different climate models. So as I mentioned, there are 37 different climate models for CMIP 5. And you can see here that for some of the climate models, there are multiple projections. So these are different initial conditions that they're using to force the models with. Um, so here, OK, so I've just selected all. But as I mentioned, you could, um, oops, sorry, there's a note. Uh, OK, so. Um, so the question is, BCSD is a monthly data. How do you use it to drive VIC model and generate daily? So um, they actually downscale it. The BCSD data has been downscaled to monthly, but then they also come up with daily, um, daily downscaling with that to actually force the model. So I haven't gotten into the details of that too much, but that's actually available. When you download the hydrology, you can get the daily downscaled data that was used to force the model. So, okay, so um, this is just, so now we've selected the projections and the variables that we're interested in. And I'll just point out also that if, um, for example, we selected hydrology here, then we get a different set of variables that are available. And next, what you do is you say if you need any analysis done on this data before. So if you know you're interested in a specific period, um, you could just download the data for, say, 10 years rather than the entire time series. And, and then you can have us go ahead and just calculate the period mean and standard deviation for you among that ensemble of data. Um, if you want to mess with it yourself, you can just say no analysis. And we also um, uh, we can also uh, 
analyze your data spatially. So we can do period mean and period standard devi deviation, or if you want um, means and standard deviation for the entire domain, you can do that if you click on statistics. So I'll say no analysis here. Um, you can get the data in NetCDF format or text format, and then you just input your email address. I'm not actually going to submit a request today, but you can just input your email address, and that'll tell us, um, they'll email you when it's ready. And then the last step, which is really helpful for us, is just if you input who you are and what you're using the data for, uh, which just helps us make sure that we're serving people's needs best. So this is, I think, probably the way most people will access data, but I'd also like to point out that you can, in the projections complete archive tab, you can download the complete data sets, which will be all of the projections for the entire continental U.S. over the entire 1950 to 2099. If you you feel comfortable extracting your the data you need and the spatial areas you need on your own, um, you can just go ahead and download it all. Um, so this is really helpful if you have a lot of different analysis to do, but it's probably a little less user friendly. So um, this is kind of the more advanced option. Also, uh, we're always open to feedback. So we have a feedback tab here. You're welcome to um, give us comments. And then I'd also like to point out that we have this links tab here, which has a lot of the documentation for the methods that we use. And what's also important is the resources that I mentioned at the beginning, if you would like, um, if you'd like a little more info. So the top one there is the Comet MetEd class that I mentioned earlier. And then the bottom is, um, is the the five to ten minute videos just about the website. So those are really good resources if um, if you want to refresh on what I've covered today. And then finally, the one I t uh, skipped over at the start are the tutorials. So we have several tutorials that include um, MATLAB scripts and Excel workbooks to help you analyze the data, and these just kind of walk you through, okay, this is what the data is going to look like, and this is what you can do um, if you want different types of analysis. So I'll just jump back to my presentation now. Uh, so yeah, so the website tutorials, um, uh, there's three main ones there. One of them evaluates the spread of projected climate changes from a reference period to a future period for a given location. Uh, another one looks at the effects of bias correction and spatial disaggregation. And then the last one looks at changes in runoff at a stream gauge. So these are just kind of um, helpful examples to understand how the data is formatted and how you can use it for analysis. So on that note, I'm also just going to close here with an example of the type of analysis that we often do with this type of data at Reclamation. So this is for uh, an example stream gauge at the Santa Ana River. So I've just, I have this map here showing our stream gauge, and we've outlined the drainage area. And what we want to do, which is pretty common, is figure out analysis between different time periods. So we're thinking of the 1990s as the historical period, and then we want to compare to three future periods, which is going to be the 2020s, 2050s, and 2070s, and look at changes in precipitation, temperature, SWE, and flow. And I'm going to show you examples of looking at spatial distribution as well as temporal trends. So uh, the first way to look at this is really easy is just to um, map your data. So here I'm showing four maps. The top left is the um, mean precipitation for the 1990s, and this is the ensemble median. So remember that this is uh, CMIPS 3, so there were 112 projections. So for every projection, we calculate the mean precipitation for that time period. So then we have 112 values, and then we plot the median of those. Um, of course, you could look at this a million ways. Um, but so this is just a map of what precipitation looked like historically in the domain. And then the next three plots so show the percent change, the median percent change in precipitation for the 2020s, 2050s, and 2070s. So what you can see from this is that in the 2020s, if anything, it looks like things are getting maybe just like a tiny bit wetter. Um, but then by the 2050s and 2070s, things are starting to get significantly drier. And that drying gets more intense as you compare from the 2050s to the 2070s. You can do the same thing for temperature. So here's just a map of temperature in the domain. And temperature, generally, we see a lot clearer signal. So here you're seeing slight warming in the 2020s, and then that warming increases as we move to each subsequent uh, future time period. 
uh, again, you can look at this for snow water equivalent. So first you see the map of snow water equivalent. You can see most of it is happening around the edges of the basin here where uh, the higher elevation. And then as you look to the future, we see significant decreases in snow water equivalents. This would be a combination of the effect of precipitation and temperature in the VIC model that's causing these impacts. So those are temporally average spatial elephants. Uh, but we could also look at temporal trends just at a point. So now uh, this, this plot here is showing time series of total precipitation, temperature, snow water equivalent, and then three different things for runoff. So annual runoff, December to March runoff, and April to July runoff. And the black line in each of these is the median of our ensemble, and then the shading extends to the 5th and 95th percentile bounds of the projection. So what's really important about all this data is that we need to use ensembles of climate projections because there's no way of really saying one model is better or is the best model. So even if you're not going to use all 112 or 234, generally you want to be using more than one because you can see there's a lot of variability between projections. So what you can see here, for example, is that precipitation, we have maybe a slight downward trend, which is what we showed with the median map. But now if you look at that um, as a time series with all of the shading around it, you can see there's huge uncertainty between the 5th and 95th percentile bounds. And the uncertainty is a lot larger than the trend. With, and this is pretty common for precipitation plots. If you look at something like temperature, though, you can see we have a much clearer trend. Of course, there is spread in the data. Um, but even with that 5th and 95th percentile bounce, you can still see a pretty clear increasing trend in temperature. Um, so then you just look at the rest of them. I mean, for snow water equivalent, it's a pretty clear decrease um, in the upper bounds of that. And then for runoff, there are these long-term declines, but again, a lot of variability in that data. So then finally, just as a last example here, I'll show, uh, this is a bar plot. So this is now looking at four different gauges in the same basin looking at um, now, again, temporal averaging. So for the 2020s in orange, 2050s in yellow, and 2070s in blue, what is the percent change in runoff annually? And then for the December to March season and April to July season. So you can see here is that in the 2020s, for all of these gauges, actually it looks like there might be an increase in runoff. Um, annually and in December to March, and this is consistent with that first map I showed you that showed potentially some minor increases in precipitation. But then as you look out further to the 2050s and 2070s, you see uh, declines, and those declines get greater from the 2050s to the 2070s. And if you look at April to July, so, um, spring and summer runoff there, you see that even in the 2020s, the uh, runoff is decreasing. So that's, these are just um, examples, I mean, I didn't really want to talk too much about the whole study that goes along with these examples, but I just wanted to show you some example plots of ways that you could look at this data and come up with some pretty simple ways of saying, okay, things are getting wetter, things are getting drier, this is what's happening to the hydrology. Um, so, so, oh yeah, there's a, I have a summary here, um, just showing changes in precipitation, so here it's getting wetter and hotter in general. And as a result, we're seeing less snowpack and less runoff. So um, that's just kind of like the big picture of what, what we're seeing. Um, and that's pretty much all I have. I just wanted to walk you guys through the website and show you some examples of how you can use the data. Um, I know we have plenty of time left, so I'm happy to answer questions that people have about how to access this data or how to use it. Great, thank you so much, Laura. Um, sure. What I'll do now is unmute the line for everyone else, and um, if you'd like to ask any questions, feel free to speak up. Um, so one second while I do that. The conference is now in talk mode. All right. Do we have any questions from the uh, participants? I have a question. That you said that on your on the one slide that Climate Wizard was going to upload um, some of these downscale projections for uh, the rest of the world. Is that the same data that will be there eventually, or is it a different scale of data set so it wouldn't match? Um. 
I don't think we're planning on doing it globally. Sorry, I don't know where I said said that, but no, this will just be for the for the U.S. as in at least in the near future that I know. That that's really the focus is. is okay, the US. It was on one of your slides so had all the data links and everything else that said that Climate Wizard was going to have global. So. Oh really? Okay. Oh, was this on the website page? Uh, right. no, it was where you had links. I think it's um, pretty. Oh yeah. Yeah, so it was on the website. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so I guess I don't know about that one. Okay. Oh, I see what you're saying right here. Um. So that isn't actually. We're not involved in that directly, so I don't. I'm not knowledgeable on that one. Sorry. Okay. So I'm just curious about watersheds that go off the off the grid. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So our. I guess our involvement in it is just for the U.S. So. Okay. Thanks. This is awesome. Sure. I have a question, Laura. Laura? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you are, uh, do you involve the hydraulic uh, setup, the weak model setup? So the, in this in the in the uh, in this data, the data is only available the temperature, the precipitation. Do we have the wind uh, wind data for this? Yeah, the wind data is available um, with the, let me just scroll up here. So in the hydrology data, I'm pretty sure if we scroll down here, it'll say, um, so for the model inputs, you can get mean wind speed. Okay, so oh, this, is only, uh, this is only in the hydrologic model results. It's actually there, well, it's, you access it through the hydrology data set, but that wind data was obtained from the GCM. Okay. So these are model these are model inputs, not model outputs with the the wind speed. And I'm not exactly sure how they got the wind speed. I wasn't involved in that development, but those are those are inputs to the models, not outputs. Okay, thank you. So uh, another question that so the historic data, which data they are picked up, you know, as a benchmark? When do they the precipitation or the temperature, they they uh, compare with uh, some uh, reference data. Uh, oh, right, yeah. So the observed data, uh, there's a Mauer data set, a gridded data set that was developed by Mauer. I think that is documented. Um, if you go to the links here in the reports, you can see exactly what data sets we used. Um, but that was, there's a historical data set um, that was built from observed gauges, and that's a gridded data set that we use as our observed baseline. Yeah, because I didn't see this information. I'm, I'm using the presumption data, and but the data mm -hmm. is only presumed PRISM data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I use this data, but this data is not too long. It will uh, start from the 1981. So you can, uh, I right. for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my right. So you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. So ours goes from 1950. So you can download that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have downloaded this and uh, do some uh, do some simulation for our project. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm okay. Thank you. Sure. Mhm. Mm I have another, a question. My name is Laura Perry, and I was um, wondering if you could take us back to the slide about how the bias correction is done. Sure. Let me just get that pulled up. Um, sure. Um, so the next slide. Um, so I was just – so. It, I I want to make sure I understand what you do here. So you look at um at it by month and then do you calculate the bias, the sort of the mean bias for each month over the 1950 to 1999 time period and then just subtract that mean for each month in the um forced data um, simulations or am I misunderstanding? You're close. It's just a little more complicated than that. So for okay. each um so for each month, we generate a CDF, um, so a probability distribution of the observed and the simulated. 
And so then rather than just figuring out the difference between the mean, we can figure out the difference between, you know, the 25th percentile, any quantile along that CDF, we can figure out what the differences are. So then when we want to take a GCM and bias correct it, we take that data and we say, okay, where does that fall in the CDF? and then how much do we need to adjust it. So that allows us to say that we have greater bias at, you know, higher temperatures than we do at lower temperatures or things like that. So we don't have to have a consistent right. bias across the entire thing. I see. And so then you have a separate CDF for each month. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. for every month, for every grid cell, we right. have 24 CDFs, 12 for oh, observed okay. and 12 for GCM. All right. All right. Okay. Um, and so and do you do the same thing when you're doing daily data downscaling, or at that point do you, are you doing Yeah, so the bias okay. correction still happens monthly. Okay. Thank you. But actually, I don't know, with the, with the local data set, that might be a little different. So I'll have to see exactly what they do with that one. All right. When is that local data set going to be ready? Do you have a predicted time? Um, I think they're hoping in the summer. But I don't. Great. Yeah, don't quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Things always take longer than expected. So we'll yeah. <laughs> It'll be great when it's available. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give another minute if people are stewing over potential questions. And uh, if we hear nothing else, then we'll wrap up. Great. Hi, Laura. Um, this is Lindsay Reynolds. I have a question. You mentioned that um, you've, met, you've talked multiple times about all the different models that go into CMEP3 and CMEP5 and how mm -hmm. you potentially might want to use all model runs or a subset. And yeah. I'm just, um, wondering if you have any resources on uh, if you do if if one wanted to use a subset, how do you choose a subset? Yeah, so that's something that's covered. Um, if you go to the links tab of the website to that Comet MetEd course, that's something that I think is covered a lot more thoroughly there. I, I can just tell you that um, one of the things that you can do is you can create um, graphs that on the x-axis show changes in precipitation and on the y-axis show changes in temperature. And then you so you'll have like a point for every one of your projections. I wish I had an example of this with me, but I don't. Um, and then so that's um, and then from that you can say, okay, I want to select five projections: one that's kind of the middle of the road, one that's really hot and really dry, one that's um, really hot and really wet. You know, basically just get all the corners of your data. So then you're only using five. Um, but there are there are other methods for how to do it too. But that's a, a pretty common one. Okay, thank you. Sure. So actually not a question, Laura. Yeah. Uh, so the what do I have the the, the CMIP three for the daily data for the uh, you know I I find they have only a uh, not continuous data. So we have the, some the continuous data from 1990, 1980, uh, 50, 50 to 2099. So you're asking about the observations if there's continuous data uh, from 1999? Uh, oh, just the CMIP, uh, CMIP3 data. Mm -hmm. It projects data taken from, they have some the data data, but that is only for some 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 uh um uh, oh yeah the yeah no, yeah, yeah, I know. Data, yeah yeah so that's because that was the BCCA downscaling and so yeah that mm -hmm. they only did for specific time periods just because that was in line with the time periods needed for projects at the time so if you wanted the continuous daily data for CMIP three then you should use the BCSD one and get it through the hydrology inputs. Um, <laughs> Or you can wait for the, I think the better daily product is going to be the LOCA downscaling that's going to come out in a couple months. And that will have um, daily data for the entire time period, and it will be at a higher resolution, so the 1 16th degree grid rather than the 1 8th degree grid. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Laura? Sure. Mm -hmm.
Well, I'm, I'm not hearing any other questions. So if you're if you're thinking you've got one, please speak up now. Uh, otherwise, I'd just like to thank you all for taking some time on your Friday to join us, and especially thank Laura for her time and uh, presenting this material and also answering the questions. I know it's a, a difficult subject, and um, I really appreciated her talk as well. So um, thank you, Laura, and um, I think that'll conclude our webinar. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.